who needs Christmas? I mean, really, like, who needs Christmas? I mean, couldn't we just, like, skip it this year? I, I mean, I know that there's some thoughts about that. Like, maybe we just skip it, right? It's not going to be like it's always been. I mean, we're not going to be able to do the things we always do. It's going to be different this year. So, eh, let's just skip it. Don't you dare. Don't you dare skip Christmas, because let me tell you who needs Christmas. I need Christmas. But I'm not the only one who needs Christmas. You need Christmas. In fact, the reality is we need Christmas. I mean, as a people, we need Christmas. I mean, MCC, we need Christmas. And I'll tell you why. Because we're praying for one. God, please give me one person to share your love with. And there is no time like Christmas to share God's love. What a wonderful time to share his love. So I need Christmas, you need Christmas, we need Christmas, and God needs Christmas. And so let's not skip Christmas. And in fact, this year, let's, let's engage in Christmas maybe more than we ever have before. Now, I know it's gonna be different, but different doesn't necessarily mean bad. It just means different. And honestly, Different might be powerful. Different might be really good. God might be up to something different that will reach different people than have ever been reached before. Some of our ones that we've been praying for on the 20th of every month as we fasted and prayed throughout 2020 and we've said, God, here are our ones. Well, this might be the time. And God's gonna reach different people in a different way. And so I, I want to ask you to, to be praying for MCC, to, to be praying for what we're working on and preparing, to, to be praying for the Christmas special that God laid on our hearts to create. We're not exactly sure where all God will place this Christmas special, but we know he has an amazing plan. Whether it's on TV and, and on social media and YouTube and Facebook and church online and in nursing homes and in prisons, we wanna get this Christmas special in the most places this Christmas to reach the most people in the shortest time. So I'm gonna ask you, would you be praying specifically for the Christmas special, the, the goodness of, of the gospel, the, the amazing story of God's love for us is presented in an engaging way that I think will, will be a gift and a blessing to people as, as they hear the wonderful songs of Christmas and then are able to encounter God in a very special, unique way this year. I'm gonna ask that you you pray along with me uh, that God would put this in the most places possible. And if you have an idea or a suggestion on where we could show the Christmas special, don't hesitate. Let us know, reach out to us, maybe help make that connection. Maybe you know of of a church that isn't able to do anything this Christmas that we could partner with and use this as a gift for them as well. Help us out, let us know. God, we know you're up to something big. God, we know you're doing amazing things. And so, Father, we ask in the name of Jesus, you you make this Christmas a time where so many of our ones will meet you. And we pray that in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. All right, so who needs Christmas? Well, our memory verse for this series is found in Luke chapter two, verse 10, right there in the heart of the Christmas story. It says, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Uh, that amazing announcement to the shepherds who were out in the fields watching their flocks at night that, that the Savior was born. That the Savior had come, that God is with us. And this will be great news for all the people. Who needs Christmas? Well, everyone and anyone, except there is a sentiment out there. And I think you're familiar with it. It, It's always there. It's been there uh, all the time, but this year it may be on the rise a little bit more. This particular sentiment, the the bah humbug. The bah humbug. Now, all that bah humbuggery, you're familiar with it, right? The, The Scrooges out there who just, you know, are like done with Christmas. They're over with Christmas. They're like, bah humbug, Christmas isn't what I wanted. Christmas isn't gonna be the same. So we're gonna skip it. Bah humbug, who needs Christmas? Not me. Well, that's kind of what bah humbug actually means. Bah humbug, humbug means a, a fraud. And so when somebody says Merry Christmas and somebody replies bah humbug, it's, it's the opposite. It's Christmas is a fraud is what they're saying. Now, why would somebody think that Christmas is a fraud? 
Ah, well, there's all kinds of reasons where somebody thinks Merry Christmas would be a fraudulent thing to say. But I think the, the, the first and foremost reason for this would be that they find no value in Christmas. That Christmas doesn't hold any actual value for them. Bah humbug, who needs Christmas? Forget that. Forget your Merry Christmas. Keep it to yourself. We don't need it. Yeah, you do. And so the bah humbug says Christmas doesn't matter. Christmas isn't important. Christmas is a fraud. And so for some people, they think, well, maybe Christmas isn't for me. Forget God. I'm done with him. I, I, don't, I don't care what he's done, and I don't care to be a part of what he's going to do. But I really think the most prevailing thought is, I'm all set without Christmas. I'm fine on my own. It, this originates within people who I think really believe that on their own, they're good. And they don't really need Christmas. You see, the story of Christmas is that we're all in desperate need of a savior, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that we've all missed the mark, that there is this perfect God in a perfect heaven who longs to have his children be with him for all of eternity. But because of sin, our rebellion against God, the things we've done that we knew God didn't want us to do or the things we neglected to do that we know God does want us to do, we've been separated from God's perfection. And so God sent his son, Jesus, a perfect savior to come into this world. The, the word became flesh, the power of God manifested in human form. And Jesus laid down his life on the cross to make a way for me and, and you, us, all people to be in a relationship with him because on the cross, Jesus took our imperfection our sin inside of him and he put it to death in his body and was buried with him in the grave. And on the third day, he rose again. This is the heart of Christmas. God has come for us to make a way for us to be with him. Merry Christmas. But those who think I'm all set on my own, I, I don't need that. Well, then bah humbug, right? I, I, don't, I don't need that. I don't require that. I'm just fine on my own. I, I, I don't want a savior. If I can't do it on my own, then I would rather do without. This is a prevailing sentiment. It's this nature of being good people or relative holiness where we compare ourselves with others or even by jumping through religious hoops. That's kind of the, the craziness of this. We take this relationship with Jesus where we are dependent upon his grace and his mercy and what he's done and what he's promised to do. And we replace that with religious rigmarole, hoops that we, that we jump through and are based on our efforts and our works and our achievements. And we push Jesus out of the equation. Bah humbug. And yet Christmas is for anyone, including the bah humbuggeries out there. That's for you. It's for all of us. There's a story in Luke chapter 10 where Jesus is asked the question about what must I do to, to be saved, to inherit eternal life? And he's asked by this expert in the law. And there is very much a bah humbug moment here where the expert in the law, he wants to justify himself. We'll read it, um, the, the first part of it, beginning in verse 25 of Luke 10. Let's listen to this together. It says, on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, what is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now we're going to stop right there. Maybe you've heard this story before and you know where this is going, but let's stop and let's, let's dig in a little bit right here into this bah humbug moment that we find in the scriptures. Uh, first of all, this expert in the law, he was a religious expert. 
He really had it going on, man. He was a high achiever in the, in the religious system. And so he's gonna put Jesus to the test. And he asks him this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, he already had his answer. It's still an interesting question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You, what do you do to become an heir? You simply are, you be. You be an heir. You, you can't make yourself an heir. Either you're an heir or you're not. You're either a child or, or you're not. And, and what God is offering for us is a way for us to become adopted sons and daughters in his kingdom, to become heirs. But not just any heirs, co-heirs with Christ. But this guy is really focused on what must I do and so Jesus says, well, what do you think? What's, what's written in the law? And the guy says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, okay, you're right. The law of love, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But then the guy wants to justify himself. This is the bah humbug moment where he says, and who is my neighbor? Who exactly am I required to love? And, and this is something I think we still deal with very much in very real ways today. Who, who is my neighbor? It's kind of crazy. I think we can think about loving God and actually literally hating our next door neighbors. To have rivalries and, and wars with the, the people that live next door or work next to us at an office or live in the same communities with us or share the same spaces. Well, it doesn't add up. That's a, that's a bah humbug kind of moment. And so in this story, what we find is a, is a stingy love. What must I do? Jesus says, well, what's written? And he's like, well, the law of love. Love, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is like, yeah, do that. And the guy says, well, who is my neighbor? You see, the deal is, is he wants to be stingy with love. He wants to hold it back and hold it in reserve. He wants to, to limit who his neighbor is. He wants a very small, narrowly defined neighbor. Maybe people who are just like him, who think like him, who dress like him, who live like him. And who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells the story, which is what he always does. And, and it begins with a man who was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's about a 17 mile journey across some, some very desert, rocky places where there were all kinds of bandits who could hide out. And it was kind of notorious as a, as a place that was pretty dangerous to be on. And this man is robbed and beaten and stripped of his clothes and, and left naked and dying in a ditch. And along comes a priest and the priest notices the man naked and dying in the ditch, but he passes by on the other side. The same too with a Levite. Now the priest and the Levite uh, in this story uh, are the, the Jewish elite, good people, servants of the most high God. Uh, the priests would work in the temple, so possibly he was on his way from Jericho to Jerusalem to perform religious duties. And so in order to do those, he would need to get there. He's got responsibilities. He's, he's got things he needs to do uh, for his people, for his neighbors. And, and there's a guy naked in the ditch, not his problem. He's got other things he needs to do for God. And he's on his way. Uh, also, if the man happened to be dead and, and the priest was to touch a, a dead body, then he would be defiled and he wouldn't be able to perform his duties. He would have to be separated for a period of time. Uh, the Levites, uh, they assisted the priests in their religious duties. So like a, a rung beneath, a little bit lower, but uh, still had their religious duties and responsibilities. Uh, but this person also passed by on the other side, had things to do for God, but not that. Not getting into the ditch with the man who was beaten and robbed and naked and left for dead. And so this is a stingy love. Uh, the man, the religious expert who asked the question, he's wanting to be stingy with his love. And, and we see two examples of stingy love. And so here's what we find. Stingy love ignores needs. It wasn't that they didn't see. They just chose to ignore it. Intentional ignorance. They saw, but walked away on the other side. Because what they were doing for God was more important than loving this person. It also plays it safe. There's no risk involved here. Uh, nope, I'm on my way. I need to keep going. Got to keep this moving along. And there could be risk if I go down in that ditch. Maybe the bandits are still around. Maybe I too will be robbed. And 
So better play it safe, better get to where I'm going, not my problem. Stingy love makes excuses. It would have been easy for the priest and the Levite to say, ah, you know, what I'm doing is for God is really, really important. And a lot of people are counting on me to perform these religious duties for God. Therefore, I'll leave the guy in the ditch and I'll practice a stingy love. And it also keeps it clean. This kind of pristine image that says, no, no, well, I'm not getting in the ditch because I've got to do my thing in my way with the people that I'm comfortable with. And this is how I'll please God. My friends, if we really are praying for one, God, please give me one person to share your love with, then we're going to encounter some people who are dying in a ditch. And God is going to give us opportunities to love our neighbors, to love them as we love ourselves, to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. And this is a game changer. This is not a a bah humbug moment, but a Merry Christmas. This is realizing that, yes, I need Christmas and everyone needs Christmas and Christmas is the real deal. Christ has come, Emmanuel, God with us. This is not a bah humbug. This is very true and very real. And I know that, so I will live it out. Now, Jesus is going to continue in the story. The the traditional form of this story would would go a priest, a Levite, and a Jewish person. A priest, a Levite, and a Jewish person. But now Jesus is going to flip it a little bit. He's going to talk about a Samaritan. And in the story, the Samaritan will be the hero of the story, which was (gasps) shocking because Jews and Samaritans did not associate with each other. In fact, Jewish people despised the Samaritans. They they couldn't stand them. Uh, They looked down on them and and really viewed them as being lesser than and not enough. And so what Jesus is really going to extend here is forget the the bah humbug. Instead, offer goodwill towards men. Goodwill. Uh, Not just an expression or a a hope, but to say, yeah, you know what? I'm going to offer something that is good for you, that will help you and assist you. And in the story, it'll it'll be the Samaritan who actually does this. So we keep reading. Jesus continues. He says, okay, the, the priest passes by, the Levite passes by, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came to where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you have. You see, the hero here is the Samaritan. He doesn't ignore. Instead, he gets down in the ditch. And so while the the religious expert, the the expert in the law, he had a very stingy love, the Samaritan has a generous love. A a love that is broadly expressed, not narrowly expressed, but broad. It's generous. It's big. It's love that isn't just in, in word, but actually expressed in deed to the least of these. It gets down and dirty. And so put against stingy love, we have generous love. This is the love of God that he gives us to share with others, which is the key in praying for one. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Uh, If our love is stingy, it's not his love. If our love is narrowly defined, it's not his love. But if our love is broad and big and generous, okay, now we're on to something. This is a love that really changes the world. This is God's love moving through us. His love is a generous love. So how is it expressed? Well, it takes action. The Samaritan doesn't pass by on the other side. He sees something that's wrong and he gets into the ditch. Generous love takes action. Generous love gets messy. Uh, The Samaritan wasn't afraid to get down and dirty. He's willing to get his hands dirty, to to be unclean, to 
not be available for religious duties, but to be engaged in loving activities. And it got messy. It heals wounds. He bandaged the man's wounds. He took care of him. And it's also assumes risk. There's all kinds of risk here. Going down in that ditch, the bandit still could have been there. He could have been put at risk too by being in this dangerous place and taking longer there. He assumed financial risk. He didn't know what this would cost, but he, he took care of him and gave the innkeeper uh, some money and said, if it, if it goes beyond this, when I come back, I'll, I'll pay any extra. This is God's love for us. It's generous, but this is the love that not only does he give us, but he invites us to share. It moves through us to other people in a, in a generous way, and it demands an expression. And if, if you know Jesus, if you have a relationship with him, uh, then already your, your heart ought to be beating a little bit faster and going, well, where will this lead me and where will this take me and what ditch am I going to climb into and, and where am I going to get messy and how risky is this going to be? And man, now we're talking about life on the edge, life with, with passion and meaning and purpose, not religious duty, but loving action. And it could be anyone. Get your eyes up, pay attention. God, please give me one person to share your love with. Well, it could be anyone and those anyone's need Christmas. And so it gets down in the ditch. It takes action, it gets messy, it heals wounds and assumes risk. And so here's a question for you. Is it naughty or nice? You kind of know the, the deal with Christmas, right? With, with kids, and, and this is maybe one of the reasons for the bah humbug sentiment is we kind of drill it into them early on with the Santa Claus thing that, hey, listen, are you on the naughty list or on the nice list? Because naughty kids, you get a lump of coal in your socking. But nice kids, you, you get gifts. Are you naughty or nice? How are you going to achieve? And that can lead to some of this self-justification that the, the religious expert was expressing. I, I've got it under control because... I'm not naughty, I'm nice. I'm, I'm the right kind of guy with the right pedigree and the right background and know the right people and I, I, I got the right answers. I, I figured it out, so I'm good. I'm all set on my own. I'm on, I'm on the nice list. And, and you know, those Samaritans, well, they're on the naughty list because they're not like me. And yet Jesus flips the whole thing in this, in this story and he says, well, no, it wasn't the priest and it wasn't the Levite. And I'm not even going to talk about the Jewish guy coming down. I'm going to talk about the Samaritan. And the Samaritan becomes the hero. And so it's really cool, the, the end of this, this story, verse 36 of Luke 10. Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And so the, the man wanted to justify himself. So he says, well, well, who is my neighbor? How stingy can I be with this love? And, and Jesus was like, well, no, we're not gonna be stingy. It's love is generous. It's, it's big. And so who was the neighbor to the man and the ditch? Well, this expert in the law, this religious person, it, he doesn't even say the Samaritan. He just says, well, the one who went in the ditch. It's like, it's like he can't get the word Samaritan out of his mouth. He, he's not quite there yet. He's saying, okay, we're the one, who, the one who helped the man. That's the one who was the neighbor. And Jesus says to him, go and do likewise. And so as we think about this, this story, uh, we have this question, right? Naughty or nice, okay, but wait a minute, who am I? Who am I? Am I naughty? Am, am, I, am I the naughty? Am I, am I the, uh, the ones who, who pass by on the other side, who are so focused on my, myself and think I've, I've got it together that I'm really missing the, the beauty and the magnitude of grace and the, the opportunity of Christmas to share God's grace and love? And is that me? Well, it's important to wrestle with. Or maybe you're going, no, 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 I'm the, I'm the nice. I mean, like Jesus said to to the, the expert in the law, okay, go and do likewise. Well, I, I, I'm like that Samaritan, yeah. 
I know people who I, that I can I definitely declare. I mean, the love of Jesus is moving through them in, in very powerful ways where they're, they're down in the ditch, man. They're getting down and dirty and they're sharing God's love and they have a broad spectrum of who their neighbor is. It's not narrow. And, and by the way, it's not just the poor. It's also the rich. Because you could flip the other side and go, yeah, forget the rich. The rich are dogs and I'm going to ignore the rich and I'm only going to minister to the poor. No. Who is my neighbor? Whoever is here. Whoever God gives me the opportunity to share his love with. I, I mean, Jesus loved the rich. How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? And with, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And he's made a way for everyone, rich, poor, and everywhere in between. For the, the religious experts and the priests and the Levites and the Samaritans and the guy in the ditch. Go and do likewise. Uh, you might take away from this and go, I want to be like the good Samaritan. Okay. But who am I? I'd like for you to consider this. Probably not really the, the naughty or the nice. I mean, I don't know. Figure that out. Pray about it. Think about it. But definitely, definitely 100%. The naked. The real point of Jesus' story is he is our neighbor. He's our neighbor. And I am naked and dying in the ditch. And you are naked and dying in the ditch. And everyone we know has been beaten and stripped naked and is dying in the ditch. And Jesus is our neighbor. He's the one who came and got down in the ditch. He's the one who left heaven and, and came to earth, was born to a virgin and laid in a manger all for the purpose of dying on the cross. He came and got down in the ditch and his love is generous. He gets messy and he heals wounds and he takes action and he assumes risk. You see, Jesus is the hero of the story. And if there's anyone in the story we can all relate to, it's the one who is desperate and dying naked in the ditch. And until we understand that, we can't possibly understand the magnitude and the meaning of Christmas that God has come for me. That when I was helpless and, and broken and left for dead, my God came for me to bring me up out of the ditch, to heal my wounds and bring restoration and wholeness, to pay the price. And it has been paid fully. This is what Christmas is all about. And who needs Christmas? I need Christmas. You need Christmas. We need Christmas. God needs Christmas. And let's not skip it, but let's engage. Let Jesus take you out of the ditch, heal you and restore you. And then as he does that, he'll use you. As you are filled with, with his love, now you'll have his love to share, which is not stingy, it's generous. Have a broad view of who your neighbor is. And then step into Christmas and watch what God will do. He's up to something really big. I know it. I think you do too. Let's not miss out on anything that he has for us. Right now, will you just simply pray and and say yes, yes to the one who has come to carry you out of the ditch. Say, yes, Jesus, I need you. Just pray that right now. Yes, Jesus, I need you. And then will you also say yes to sharing a generous love? Yes, I will share your generous love. Yes, Father, we say yes to you this Christmas.
Yes. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus.